looking at right now. Whoops. Try that again. There's a, a link there in the pre, uh, for the presentation. So I've put that in the chat. Then I'll give you a copy or a, a, a link to the slides. You can always download it. One of the things is we're not covering everything that I have in the slide. So I really recommend you go through. There's some videos in there that are worth taking a look at to give you some better ideas. So it's a great resource to, to kind of follow up and go into more detail about what I'm talking. During this session, if you have any questions, there is a link there for the Q&A. Basically, you click on that link, it'll take you to a, a page, just put in your questions. And then what we'll do at the end of the session, we'll go through the questions and display them on the screen and be able to answer them all uh, that way. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, my name is Trevor Beck. I am a Google Apps for Education certified trainer and innovator, which means I've taken a lot of Google training and tests and stuff like that. And I know a lot of stuff about Google. I do not work for Google. Google does not pay me, but I've been to a number of their campuses around the world and uh, it is, they're pretty cool. But other than that, no, I, uh, I do not work for Google. But like I said, I spent a lot of time doing this. I've been at McEwen University teaching Google stuff for probably 12 years at least. And there's a link there to my website. During the session or after the session, if you have any questions, by all means, go to the website. There's a contact tab. It's an old site. I'm just in the process of moving it over. So please disregard the, uh, the state that it's in right now, but the, the contact form still works perfectly fine. So again, if you have any questions, by all means, please put them in that, uh, that piece there with the link. Okay, uh, and then we just talked about that and that's all inside the chat. So one of the things that I did beforehand is I, we were sending out a survey asking people just to give us some idea of what their uh, comfort level is with the, this thing. So I just wanna kind of go over that. One of the nice things about working with these online tools like Google Forms is it creates these great little reports that we can quickly look after. So anytime that you have someone that says to you, send an email out and find out about ABC, email is not the way to do it anymore. And it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction. It's the way a lot of us grew up with. But the idea is anytime we're collecting data or getting responses back and stuff, email's not the answer. There's a better choice. And in this case, we can take a look. I'm just gonna increase the uh, zoom here just so you can see it. But we can go through and we can see that we've got 42% are in Apple. We've got the Android people there and then, uh, sorry, Pixels and Android and, and Microsoft. So nicely, quickly, I can go through and have uh, those, those results show up. So right now, most people are using email for their project communications. Some people are using texting, some are using Facebook Messenger. Okay, that's cool. And some are using Apple Messages. Wonderful. Comfort level. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we look at, you know, it's from zero to six, of course, these are the higher. So everyone's kind of about the same with using Chrome. Some people are more comfortable using Google Drive. Uh, whoa, whoa, we've got lots of people who never use Google Sheets. Google Sheets is a wonderful tool and we'll, and we'll see that in a little bit. And most people haven't used Google Forms. So this is a great example of why you would use Google Forms. Specific skills, some people are sharing documents, some people are comfortable with working with collaborating docs. No, some people don't know anything about revision history, that's fine, we're gonna talk all about that stuff. And just quickly, some comments here, how can I protect my files? I've had users delete them on me, oh yeah. Uh, you listen to Google's, yep, the same provision comfort as, and you know what, this is just a matter of playing with it. I gave up Microsoft for about 10 years and all I did, did was use Google. Now, now I'm a trainer, I do Microsoft, Google, WebEx, all of it, I'm comfortable in all of it, but Google still, when it comes to collaborating, is awesome. A uh, system that can collaborate using our CL board. I'm not sure what CL board is. Jenny, is that something you can help me with? Oh, yeah, that would just be Community League board. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Sure, all right. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about all that. And managing users in my group, making working groups in Google. Yeah, we'll talk all about that. Excellent, good. Thank you for your, for your surveys. All right, so Google for Nonprofits provides qualified organizations free Google services. The most commonly used services are Google Workspace, which is basically Google's version of Microsoft Office and Google AdWords. So today we're gonna to be looking at Google um, Workspace. Google AdWords is also something that's great. If you qualify and are approved by Google, Google will give you $10,000 in free advertising uh, through Google AdWords every month. So your, your, your upcoming events, uh, whatever other things that you want to promote, 10,000 bucks, play with it, go for it. 
not cash, it's just 10,000 of free advertising. So there are a lot of people that take advantage of that. We're not gonna be talking about that today, but just so you're aware that that is available once you are approved uh, through Google. So for a lot of nonprofits that I've talked to in the past, they ended up storing all their files on a desktop computer that's shoved underneath their, their desk. The problem with the files there on that computer is what happens if that computer gets stolen? That affects all of your, your policies, all your documents, your, your volunteers, your, your sponsors, all those lists suddenly disappear because the computer itself got stolen. Sometimes your hard drive or your files get corrupted. What if there's fire damage or water damage, right? That computer gets, gets wiped out, everything gets wiped out with it. And then I'll have someone say, well, you know, we've got backups. And I'll say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah we've got a backup. Well, I said, where is it? Well, it's right beside the hard drive. Well, guess what? That can get stolen and can get have fire, water damage, fire and water damage and corrupted as well. So it's really not a, I mean, having a backup is one thing, but having a backup that sits right beside the computer is kind of not the best uh, choice. When you're working with those kind of files, you're working with multiple copies. So when I go and I send out an email to 10 people and I attach a Word document to it, that's 10 extra new copies that got created. And when those files come back to me, which is the most up-to-date? The one that I have, the three that someone else sent, maybe the president was working on something and sent me something and said, you know, update this and you don't know where it is. And that's because you're working with multiple copies. What we're gonna be talking about today is why you should use an online service. Whether it's Google or Microsoft, it doesn't matter. The advantages are all the same. But the important thing is to take a look at those reasons why you should move away from those locally stored drives and those attachments and stuff and work with online. So the first thing is when used properly, all your files are owned by the organization, regardless who created them. So for those of you that are using a personal Gmail account and creating uh, folders and stuff like that, you'll have a shared folder there and other people will be putting files in there. So when you're using that shared folder, the creator remains the owner. So this means that when the owner deletes a file, everyone loses access and the files are often lost and gone forever because the files belong to whoever created that. That's using a shared folder. In Google Drive, we have something now called a shared drive and a shared file stored in a shared drive are owned by the organization and only those with the proper access can delete the file. So you'll notice here, there's no names attached to it because they're not owned by Trevor or anyone else, they are owned by the organization. Access to documents is controlled by the organization. So documents and email accounts can quickly be reassigned to new users as, as they come on board. Your outgoing president leaves, you have a new president come in, all you have to do is, is, is change the password, give that information to the new president, they log in, bang. They have access to all the email that was there, that was used before, all the, the, the files that were attached, all, all the assets, anything that was assigned to the president account is now available to the new person. And because the password's been changed, it's been removed from the old person. You control who has access to the files. Online collaboration in Google means you can have 250 people working on the same file at the exact same time. And you can see those changes as they happen. So think about that. You can create and edit grant proposals, meeting agendas, and more. And all that's going to happen in real time. Or it could be I'm going to work on it for a little while and later tonight someone else is going to work on it. But there's no files being shuffled around back and forth. This is all done online. Uh, what could someone just make sure that you've got your mute on, please? You can also share these files with anyone, whether they use Google or not. And if need be, you can edit your Microsoft files um, in Google Drive as well. So you can have those, those Microsoft files. You can still use Google to edit them. Best part of all of this is all these files are extremely mobile friendly. You can work on them with an app. I don't know if you've ever tried to use some of the mobile apps for Microsoft. It's um, not friendly. Uh, and as someone who's been teaching this stuff for a few years, I, I know what I'm talking about. But the nice thing is about this is that um, the mobile devices for Google and the mobile apps work really well to make those edits and stuff. It's not the exact same as working on the actual document, but you'll get the idea. 
Powerful search makes finding your documents easy. So just like a regular Google search, you can quickly search through and filter through the files that you have access to. So I often will, when I create my, my information, I'll store stuff in folders, but I don't do like five levels deep and you know, kind of organize all that stuff. Quite often, if I'm working on a project, I'll go, huh, I need access to file ABC. I just type in search and bang, the file comes up. I do not spend a lot of time in organizing it. The best part of that is as you have access to files that are shared to, with you from other people, those become available in your Google search. So you can quickly search on the file, regardless of whether the word you're searching for is in the title or in the body of the text or anything, and it will find those files. And then you can use filtering processes to say, you know what, I got a hundred files here when I search for the word dog. Uh, I only interested in the slide deck that I created for it, or maybe the spreadsheet. And I can filter down and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and get into that much more finite uh, search results. Imagine communicating more efficiently. You can stay in touch with your volunteers, your supporters, and your community using the Google tools. You can create custom websites. You can have email distribution lists or secure video calls without the one hour limit. Most of you are probably used to using Zoom or something like that, but with the nonprofit, uh, of Google for nonprofit, you get Google Meets. Google Meets allows you to have video conferencing. I think the limit is either 24 or 48 hours. I can't remember. And so, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's no way I'm gonna be in a 24 hour meeting. But the nice thing is that you, these video conferencing tools are web-based, so anyone can join in. Even if you're not a member of uh, or, or even have a Gmail account, you can come on and join those meetings. You have breakout rooms. So if you do have a large group of people, you can have breakout rooms where the different groups are going to go and talk about different topics, and then you can bring them all back. There's lots of great functionality that's available to you when you look at uh, Google Meets. And these are just an example of some of the different apps that are available. I mean, basically you've got a Gmail designed specifically for your organization. We talked about video meets. There's a chat function, which is very similar to, similar to like Facebook Messenger, but it's for Google people and it's for your group. So your board or whoever it is can have a group together and have communication going on through there. Lots of great communication tools are available to you. Um, Enterprise level security means your organization data is safe and protected. And anytime there are new patches or updates available, they're automatically applied by Google right through the browser. So it has nothing to do with updating your computer. Your computer doesn't change. It's just a web browser, it's just a window. But what goes on in the back end and Google side of things, they update that right away. And they keep up to date on those things a lot because they are charging other people uh, money for this stuff. This is a paid service. So they have to make sure that they get that information and keep secure and it's not easily accessible. Okay, uh, let me just see if there are any quick questions here. So just give me a sec. No, no questions. Okay, just a reminder here. So there's that slide app.googlegl. The link's in the chat. If you have a question, uh, go ahead and just uh, pull that open. What I do want to do though at this point in time is I'm going to stop my sharing and we're going to do some hands-on stuff. Woo, this is exciting, Trevor. So just give me a second. I'll get that link for you. Copy link address into the chat. And if you can all just come and visit this page, that would be awesome. And I am going to reshare my screen here right away as soon as I find the controllers. Where to go? There it is. And my whole desktop. Jenny, can you confirm that you've got the uh, the whole screen showing up there? Yes, the I desktop? do. Yeah, Perfect. Looks, looks okay. great. So I am going to do this. So what I've got here um, is I've got this one page. It's, and is everyone able to get in there and, uh, whoops, stop doing that. Everyone able to get in there and, and, and see the folders and stuff? I'm going to assume yes. If you have any problems, just uh, let me know. But you should see something that looks like this here, or it might look like this on the right. So I've, on the left-hand side, I've got my work account or my, my education account. And on the right-hand side is a personal Gmail account. And what I've done is I've created a shared folder that is available to everybody. So you should be able to see all this. On the right-hand side, if your view looks like this, 
up in the top right hand corner if you want to click on this little box here it'll actually put it uh, by text only it makes it easier to read the words and stuff and and work with that that's how i prefer to do things okay can i get everyone to open up zero zero blank document so this is an example of an exercise that i have done in the past where i was working at a department there was like 100 people in there and and I was asked, hey, Trevor, we're going to go out on a retreat. Can you find out what everyone wants for meals? Don't start yet. Everyone wants for meals and stuff. Can you start putting those in there? So what would happen is I would have to send this out to 100 people and then get the information and collect it and then collate it and all that kind of stuff. Now what I would do is I would use this. I would say, hey, guys, here's a document. I would send it all out and then they would put in their stuff there. Now. You guys are going to start entering stuff. Feel free to scroll down there. I mean, you can enter at the top there or whatever, but go ahead and start adding some suggestions, please. This is going to be a fancy work retreat. I see Eggs Benedict in there. <laughs> well, th these are just suggestions. You're not going to get it. <laughs> Oh, I can't believe nobody put that in there yet. Oh. There we go. <laughs> okay, how about we get everyone to stop now? So hands off your keyboards, please. So let's take a look here. What are some of the things that, that you noticed in this? And if you wanna come off and unmute yourself and answer something or stick your hand up and ask for something and answer, that's fine too. All right, Trevor's gonna go ahead. So. First thing is, what's really nice, is that you can see other people working. And, and the beauty of this is we have this one document, but you guys are all on different sections. So notice here, I've got the breakfast here on this side, but over here, Jazz is over here working on the dinner stuff. So even though it's a single document, I don't have to be on the same page. I can be on page 37 with one person and someone else could be on page five, someone else could be on 13. That's the beauty of it. It is accessible to everyone and the whole document, not just one page at a time. So it's really easy for people to be assigned a section and say, hey, you're gonna be working on the, the section on breakfast. You're gonna work on the section on, on, on dinner and go through that. Notice that I was able to go in and format stuff. While you guys were still making your entries, I went in and put in those bullet form notes. I went to a conference once and uh, I had the, the presenter who did the same thing. And there was probably about 200 people in the group. And the, the presenter was asking for information to be submitted. So people were going in there doing all that. While that was going on, I went in, I formatted everything. I went in and, and put in the bullet form. I made the text bigger because she was presenting. And so give her bigger text to see rather than having to squint. So I increased the font size. I did all this kind of stuff and got rid of the duplicates and stuff. So when she got to work on it, she had a nice clean document that was easy to read. And guess what? I never met her. They didn't talk to her afterwards or anything, but it's just one of those things when you've got a shared document, people can take on different roles. You could have your secretary, whoever's filling that position, could be going through and just quickly jotting down the notes, but someone else could go in and clean up the formatting. Then, then you have this documents ready to go by the time your meeting's over. Coffee was in there. How come no one else put coffee down? Because it was already captured. If we'd done emails and I sent out to 100 people, I would get probably 90 emails back. And the first thing that would be on that list would be coffee. And I'd open up the next email and it'd be coffee, coffee, coffee. Get where I'm going at? Because with the email, you're working in a silo. You, get, you don't get to see what anyone else gets to see. This is what, what's, what's great about it is now you can work off of what's, um, what's there and go, I don't need to add anything else. Um, I'm going to go into here. Uh, let me just see here. We have steak, chicken juice, and gobbledygook. Uh, hot wings, milk, milk, milk and soup. Uh, hot wings, Greek salad, chef salad. I, I can't guarantee it for sure, but I'm willing to bet that when someone put Greek salad down, someone else might have went, ooh, or how about chef salad? Just like up here, typically I get when someone sees coffee, I always have someone go put Bailey's in there. Why did you put that in there? because I saw coffee was there, it triggered something in my brain and it made me go, ooh, we also need to have Bailey's or we also need to have this. 
So again, this is true collaboration because we're working off of each other's uh, input. It's not just this silo that we work at. Documents are awesome for this kind of stuff. What else are documents good for? Well, guess what? I can enter information on my phone. So I'm gonna go into here. So just under waffles here, I'm just gonna put in my cursor and I'm gonna enter some stuff in. Give me a second, do, do, do. It's under waffles. I can also add other things that I want to see. And notice as I'm adding that, typing that right on my phone here, that's showing up on the screen there, right? You know what? I hate typing. Every mobile device, um, when you bring up the keyboard, somewhere on the side, there's a microphone, whether it's on Android or on um, um, uh, Apple. And when you tap on that microphone, you get to start typing with your voice, period. New paragraph, new paragraph. I like to play with small puppies and cute kittens, period. New paragraph, all work and no play, and that makes Jack a very dull boy, period. Look how fast that was. So sometimes um, I've I've told I've told people like um, from McCune, we've had a conference I went to is a childcare conference, and often they have to take notes on the kids and stuff. And I said, you know what? Don't type it down. Just pull it open. Have a document with this kid's name on it, and just start talking. Put your notes in verbally that way. Now it doesn't. It's not going to take and do um, a transcription where I can hold the microphone up to somebody and it's going to do all that. It doesn't do that, uh, not, not by itself. There are other services that will allow you to do that, but it is makes it a lot easier. At times I've had a carpal tunnel, my, my arm, arm was really sore. So I can go in and use the tools either, in this case, I was using the tools built into my phone, but the tools are also available directly in Google. So Google also has voice type typing so that I can use the same tools and do the same thing, comma, but it's a little bit different, comma, but it's Google, comma, but I still have this wonderful option that I can go and talk and my words show up on the screen, period, new paragraph. Winky face, new paragraph. Oh, usually it gives me a winky face. <clears throat> How easy is that? So these are, again, the reasons why working, uh, instead of working in a silo, but working on these online tools are awesome. Okay, let me double check on that. Where's my other screen here for that? Here, I'm just going to pull this over here. Uh, let me see what else we're going to do. I talked talk to voice to text. Oh, versions. Okay, sure. Let's talk about versions. Someone asked about that. Google automatically saves versions. You don't have to do version one, version two, version three, and all that stuff. It actually does that for you. So I'm going to show you a version history of, for this file. I have been using this file since, let's see how far back we can go. Come on, go back, go back, go back. Uh, 2017. I actually have another file we're gonna look at in a second that, oh, no, I lied, we go back farther yet. Pretty sure it's 2014 that I started using these. Okay, not this one, but I have another file. I went back to 2014. So I can go and click on here and I can see what that document looked like back in 2014, in this case, 2015, excuse me. The other great thing about this is when people say things like, well, someone must have changed that because I don't remember that, or I never changed that. Well, guess what? I can go in here and I can tell you who wrote what. So under muffins, Darlene wrote muffins, uh, Laura wrote bacon, Sylvia wrote, wrote eggs, steak sandwich, and we can see all that information here. That's from 2015. So not only does it show you the, the data, but it also shows you who wrote the stuff. And I can go and say, you know what? This is a great list here. I'm gonna copy this list and I'm gonna go back to my original document, which is the one we're working on right now. And I'm gonna add that information in here as well. How cool is that? Oh, language translation. Sure, let's, um, let me come back to that in a sec. Don't let me forget about it, but we'll come back to that in a sec. So that's the hands-on part that you guys got to see. Let's go back into a shared folder here and I'm gonna open up Sherlock Holmes, number one here. So here's the, so this is the same file we've got here going back and forth. I'm just gonna move these windows around a little bit better. So 
for a lot of people, they tend to, when they're putting out newsletters or other documents, they tend to put stuff in PDFs. PDFs were great 10 years ago and older. PDFs suck. Uh, and if I, can, if I could rip a PDF out of your hand, I would do that right now. The problem with PDFs is they are, first of all, they are not mobile friendly. Have you ever read a PDF in a, on, on, a, on a phone? It comes in as a picture of the size here. You have to zoom in like this. Then you start at the first line and you go across and read that line. Then you go back to the second line and back to the third line. And by that time you said, forget this, I'll read it later. PDFs are like a picture, so they don't really read well. This that you're looking at right now is text. And the beauty of text is depending on the width of your document or your device, it'll wrap it. So if I was to read this file here on this screen here, it would probably end about the word author and phys physician Sir Arthur Conan would, would go underneath it. So it wraps it around. So all I have to do is just nice and smooth and read it. Is my, if I turn my, my screen a bit wider to give it more real estate, or if I'm using a big different tablet, it's going to resize that. So it's still an easy read on top of this. Now, the document that's up here right now is set up like I would a PDF or a newsletter. I just go off to the right hand side. You can see here. So Jazz here is actually a Gmail account. This is a work account. So I'm just sharing it to anyone that's got access to it. They can only view it. They can't make any changes. So you can, and you guys can try if you want to go and make some changes. Nothing's going to happen. Just like a PDF, you can't make any changes really. The best thing though about this is I can correct mistakes. So how many times have you had a PDF go out? And then about 20 minutes later, a second PDF come out, version two. Well, guess what happened? There was a typo in there or something. So they felt they had to send it out. So they send it out to 100 people. Five people opened it up right away. Three of those people noticed this typo, reported it. And so these guys went and sent out a second email. If this happened with a Google Doc, I would just go change it. I send it out to 100 people. Five people are reading it. Two people say, Trevor, you, Holmes has an L in it. I go, oh, okay. So remember, there's 95 people who haven't even read this document yet. And on your screen now, Holmes is spelled correctly. This is awesome because this is a live breathing document that you can quickly go in and make your changes and update whatever you need to do. So PDFs are out. This is the way to start looking into those documents. And depending on what you're doing, if you wanna take your newsletter to a next level, you can, you can use video, you can do, uh, you know, like a YouTube link or something like that. This might not be the tool for it, like Google Docs, you might want to use Google Sites instead, or, or maybe a PowerPoint slide, or sorry, Google Slides, which is their presentation tool, you can use Google Slides to do a presentation that will embed text as well as video. So depending on what you want to do, there's different tools and different ways to do it. But as most of us work with text, this is so easy to update and change right away. Um, one of the things that I was talking earlier about that I wanted to show you was translation. So a lot of us are in communities. We have people in there that uh, English is not their, their primary language or their first language. So let's say maybe we want to try and start converting our documents so that they're available to people in those languages. Let's say you've got a bunch of people coming in from Ukraine. They want to be part of the community. Don't speak any English at all. Um, and they're kind of depending on their young children to help them out. Well, once you've done your document, you can go under tools and I can translate the document to whatever language I want. I'm just gonna pick Ukrainian just cause I was talking about it and I'll translate it. And now I have a brand new document in Ukrainian. How accurate is it? It's not gonna be exact, just like anything else. Well, quite frankly, translators aren't exact translators cause everyone's got a different way of putting a spin on things, but it's sure gonna give them a lot of the basic idea of what it is you're trying to communicate to. This is an excellent tool. I've done work with uh, international schools where they have um, students from all over the world and parents that are coming there. And this is what I showed them. And they were like, oh my God, this is awesome. I can create these different versions of our newsletter we send out or the letter we have to send home with the child. The parent doesn't speak, uh, doesn't read English. They have to trust that the kid's telling them what the truth is, right? Here, this way they get, they get a document that they can easily read and understand. And those are just some of the different documents that you can make use of in what you're doing with your communities. Um, let me just take a quick look and see, do we have any questions? Still no questions? Okay. <clears throat> Either I'm doing a really good job or you guys fell asleep, one of the two. 
Do you, do you want to just pause for one second, Trevor? I just, I did have a message on the side, just somebody catching up. I just want to make sure that sure. everybody has been able to find the documents and the links and you're keeping up. I know you're all being a nice, polite, quiet group here, but just want to make sure you can unmute at any moment. If you do need to just jump in, we're a nice small group and make sure you are putting it in the chat. And okay, you're following perfect. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, am I am I going too fast or am I doing okay, guys? I think we've got a few. I'm following. And then just one question about the doc. Um, which doc we're in right now is the is I'll put a link to it again. Just one sec. Um, or you know what? Let's let's this here. I'll just copy this link. We'll use this one here. Actually, well, actually, we, yeah, we're not we're not going to be doing any more hands on at this point in time. I just wanted to uh, to show you that. But I mean, everything that you just saw now, you can do with Google spreadsheets. You can do with Google Slides, which is their version of PowerPoint. So all these documents are available for you to work on together collaboratively, because that's one thing Google does very, very well is the collaboration and making those tools easily available to everyone. All right, let's take a look. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, there's, there's mobile apps that, as you saw there before, that we can do. So it makes things a lot easier to, to, to do those things on the, on the run. So let's talk about forms and spreadsheets. I imagine you guys have events and you have volunteer signups. And uh, we we did this, I like I said, I worked, I've been working at McEwen for 30 years and we had our open house and they were doing everything through email and stuff and trying to coordinate it. And it was just a headache. And I said, hey, you know what? Let's do something. Let's go ahead and do this using forms and spreadsheets. Now, most of you are gonna go, oh, spreadsheet, that's financial, I hate finance. Totally with you, I am on the same boat. But spreadsheets can also be used for data, not just for financial stuff. And that to me is where it's exciting. So I'm just gonna show you uh, an example based on some of the stuff that we, we did. And I'm just gonna pull up this here. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see it. So the first thing is I'm gonna show you this, this um, form. So the form, would send out to people the first name, last name, their emails, whatever other information we want. And then what are the positions you want? So pick three positions. Um, I've suggested like, you know what? I'm willing to do three positions. Don't waste your time trying to say first choice, second choice, third choice. That's just so it complicates anything. So I always say to people, you know, just ask for what are the three positions they're willing to do? Because it shouldn't matter. I'll do any of them. And then we have a, a data collection statement. So that's our form, really simple. The beauty of this is the form then gets populated directly into a, a spreadsheet. Now, I know you're going to go, oh, this is going to be so complicated, I hate rows and columns, but really it's not. I've got a resource later on of some videos that I've created over time that'll show you how to do all this stuff. And it's so easy to do. It's just a matter of, you know, getting familiar with, with a spreadsheet and what you can do with it. So here's my dashboard that I've created for this spreadsheet. And there are all the different positions. Here are the number of spots we need filled. Here are the number of people that we've assigned to those positions currently. So I need five. I have currently four people assigned there. So just remember this dashboard here for a second. And I'm going to go to this tab called Form Responses. This is all the submissions that we just saw. So as people fill out the form, it automatically gets thrown in here. We get a timestamp of when it happened, the, the, the email address, the first name and the last name. And remember I said three different things. There are the three different choices that they all put in. Some are want to be activity counters, some want directional greeters, et cetera, et cetera. But we've gone in and put them in. For some of these, we've gone in and assigned these positions already. Now, one of the things that's nice about this is um, all their choices are in here. Most people's first instinct is like, if I wanna find out everyone that wants to be an activity counter, I'm gonna go in and sort. First thing I say to people is never, 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 ever sort your original data. Because what'll happen is someone gets focused and they go, well, they want this in alphabetical order. They just go to here, they hit sort. This will change because it's selected. This does not. Five minutes later, they go, huh, 
That's not right. I know Aaron said he wanted to be activity, but it's showing directional greeter. You've corrupted your data. There's no going back from that. It's just, it's brutally ugly. So never, never sort this stuff. I mean, if you have to make a copy of it, play with that, but I'm gonna show you a better way of doing that. Um, so what we can do is we can use something called filtered views. So filtered views are available for Excel as well. Basically it's all it means is I'm gonna tell you what I want and you hide everything else. So I'm not gonna go into detail about that just because of time, but I've created filter views that basically say, show me all the rows where in this here activity counter, that position shows up. So notice here, we've got directional and directional. There's no activity. I'm gonna select that. Bang, now I'm looking at just those ones I want. And I'm gonna start assigning those positions. So remember I said, I've got five, uh, five positions in there. I'm actually going to go in and I'm going to take this one here and I'm going to assign them to the position of activity counter. These drop down things look impressive. They're really easy to do. They're not scary at all. <clears throat> but we'll come back to that in a second. So I've gone in and actually, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back into here and, and take that off. Let's go with report by name for a second. So this data here, I want to see it by name. Now, I don't want to do copy, paste it, sort it, because if I make changes here, then I have to do it on the other tab. So there is a little function or called a query. It's not scary. All it basically means is, hey, grab all the data from here and put it the way I want it, which in this case is in, instead of having all five or eight columns, I only want these four columns and I want them sorted by first name. So there's Aaron. He's an event assistant. He hasn't got a position assigned yet. I also created a report doing the same thing here report by position. So it's listing them in position alphabetically. So these guys have not been assigned positions and there's the activity greeter counter for Elijah. These are read only, which means that they grab the data from here and then make it work. So I'm gonna go into here with Aaron. I'm gonna go activity counter. Let's go report by name. Where's Aaron, 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 Aaron. Yep, Aaron's now got that position. Let's look at these positions here. Aaron is now part of the activity counter. So it's gone in and resorted this stuff automatically, sorting by this here first, then by name. So now we can see Aaron's part of that. Remember that dashboard? As Soon as I added another person, it went, hey, guess what? We have matched. So I've got something in there called conditional filter, uh, sorry, conditional formatting, which basically says when this number matches that number, turn green. So now I can stop working on activity. I can go down to and assign directional greeters. And if I was to go down here, I have a filter here for directional greeters. Just go through the same process. If you get, you know, kind of trigger happy and you load up a couple extra ones, guess what? Turns it red. Whoa, you got too many counters. That's all it's saying. This is really easy to do, but boy, can this make it so much easier to assign those positions, to get those volunteers organized and get these reports where it's by name, by position. Who are their activities? Who's supposed to be a directional greeter? Here's a list of names, bang. I don't have to go hunting and pecking. And once these are set up, you can rinse and reuse these, sorry, rinse and repeat and reuse these things all throughout the year for different, your different uh, pieces, pieces, your different events and stuff. Um, how do you create that original form tab? Let's go a quick look at the questions here. Uh, how do you create the original form tab? Are you talking, how do I, how do I create the original form? Um, that is in, within Google Drive. Uh, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but I mean, when you go to new here, one of the things is Google Forms. You can create a form there. Um, if everyone has access to workplace and one person sorts it, have you corrupted and lost your data? Okay, so this is this is um, this is a shared file, right? So it's it's one file that everyone can come work on at the same time. So if one person sorts it, it's that file, right? It's like it's like the the one car in the house, and there's five people that drive it. If someone bangs it up, it's banged up for everybody. So yeah, if someone goes that doesn't know what they're doing, sorts it and, and messes it up it's messed up for everyone because it's the same exact file. There are things that you can do to protect it. If the person doesn't need to be editing it, I can give them view only access. And I just create these reports and they just click on it and go, okay, I can see Ariel's a directional greeter. 
So that's that's things that I do. There's ways of protecting the the, the sheet to say, if someone tries to make a change in here, either block them or give them a message saying, you're trying to change something, don't do that. So there are ways of protecting it. And it just depends on what the role is of the person that's coming in. Do they need to actually edit or do they just need to be able to view it? And nine times out of 10, if there's someone that's, that's editing, they usually know what they're doing. So you only give out edit access to those that actually need it. That's the first rule of thumb. Um, so yeah, so that's that, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, do Google Docs and spreadsheets have the ability to work with a mail merge? Um, no, yes, but there's third-party tools that you would have to use. Not rocket science. Some of them are paid for, so they're really easy. Um, there's a couple that I use that are free, but yeah, you can easily do that. It's a spreadsheet, so in the end, like if you're using um, not SurveyMonkey, but um, oh, what's the big one? That Mailchimp. Thank you. Yes, you knew. You know what I was going for. There's a monkey in there. Um, like Mailchimp, you can export this as a CSV file or whatever else. There are uh, other. There are applications that people have created, um, and some of them are free. Some of them you pay for, right? And so some of them are hit and miss. I actually have one that I use all the time. It's old. It's chunky, but it it's rock solid. It works. It's got people behind it, money behind it, as opposed to John decided to create it himself. So yeah, there's there's lots you can do with that. And with the difference too, is if you're using a personal Gmail account and you try to send out emails, I think you are limited to 250 emails that you can send out in a single day. Uh, maybe it's 500, but I think it's 250. Uh, when you get to a account like this, uh, a, a work account, you can send out 1500 a day. So there's limitations. If you're trying to send out 3000, then you're not, this is the wrong tool or else, yeah, this is the wrong tool. There might be something else that you need to do. So just depending on what your needs are. Trevor, there were also a few questions submitted through the link. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, give me a sec here. Let me just bring this up here. Uh, okay. Please clarify cost and access. Uh, if you qualify, and we'll talk about that at the end here, if you qualify after applying to Google, there is no cost. How's that? There we go. Uh, okay, people use PDF for version control and to not allow amendments to the document. How does that work in Google? Uh, well, as I just showed you, I only, you guys, that that uh, zero one Sherlock Holmes, you can't make any changes to it. Only I can, because I have edit access. So it's the same thing, you only grant edit access to the two or three people that need it. Everyone else can view it. Nobody can make changes to it. <laughs> uh, last question here. How can I implement a payment option like Square or Stripe for an event that may cost money in the form? Well, the form is a volunteer sign up. It is not a event. So those are two different use cases. Um, I would suggest like if you're going to do an event, you would use an event tool like, sorry, uh, Jenny, what's the tool that you use? To create yeah, this? Eventbrite is a great one. Yeah. Which was event? event? Did you say Eventbrite? Eventbrite. Sorry, yes. So Eventbrite would be something that you would do. This is I I I mean there are these tools are good for good uses, but there are other tools that are created and developed specifically for certain purposes. So events, Eventbrite is designed for that to do all those things. Mm -hmm. Google Forms is for those things that kind of fall into crack. I mean, you wouldn't use Eventbrite to sign up volunteers because you still have to assign them to something. So you still have to do some work in a spreadsheet or something like that. Good questions, thank you. Okay, uh, whoops, go back here. So, so that's this, I just wanna get through some of this stuff because I know we're on short on time. So I just wanna make sure we stick with this. One of the beautiful things, beautiful things that I love about Google is its controls. So you can keep control of who has access to what files and stuff. And I'll give you a great example here, which is the board of directors. I've set up this up for a number of times. If you're a secretary for the board of directors, one of the things that you hate is that email or that phone call that says, where are the files? Where's this week's agenda? Where are the minutes from last week or two weeks, blah, blah, blah. The beauty of this is that we've got them all stored in different locations. So you have Google Drive and you're gonna have the email stored somewhere else in the calendar and all that, but we can bring them all together into a website. So this is an example of a website I just built. Um, what, I don't think there's a Panda Fox Society, it's a fake one, but here's the kind of things that go on in that. This is the place where all the board members come. If you've got a question, come here first, because there's the answer. So 
what's on the agenda this week? Well, first of all, I've got a calendar embedded here. And the calendar can be, again, updated and maintained by the, the secretary and the president and the vice president, who knows. But you assign whoever needs to have access to it. There's all the dates of the calendar. So I, I don't have to ask when's the next meeting. There it is. What's on the agenda? I can click open here. There's some ba basic description. So there's a map to the location if we need to. But I'm going to go into more details. And this would open up on everyone who has access to this calendar. In other words, just the board members, nobody else. So from here, there's two documents. Guess what? There's the agenda. I just opened, so the agenda for June 28th. I click on that, there's my agenda information. How about the minutes from the meeting for that meeting? I click on that, there's the minutes. I personally put my agenda and minutes in the same document. It's never made sense that they should be separate documents. If I have the agenda, why can't the minutes fall right after that? But some people like to do it this way. I could also attach the minutes from last week's meeting or last the last meeting so that people can go in and reference them and review them before we even start our, me our, me our meeting for this week. And there's the link for use Google Meet. Google Meet's a video tool that we talked about that allows you guys to meet. Everyone clicks on that, bang, we start the meeting up, rock and roll, easy peasy. So that's one of the beauties of, of this is we now have all of our calendar information and links to the documents and stuff right there. There's another section that I've put in here, which is the, to write directly to the SharePoint, or sorry, SharePoint, too much Microsoft, uh, to the shared drive and Google has. So the board has its own folder or it's a special folder called Google Drive. Only the board members can get in to see that stuff. There's different folders in there. I may give the board members different rights. So maybe the policy and procedures, only the secretary and the president has edit access, but all the other board members can read and leave comments and stuff like that. But that's all stored in one area. So if I wanted to find out, you know, what's our policies and procedures, I just click on that. There's policy one, there's policy two. I'm an owner. So if I open this up, I can edit it, but you might be on the board. You might only be able to leave a comment. You can't make any actual lasting changes. Again, all that stuff, one location. The other part of it is we have what's called a, an email archive using Google Groups for business. So Google Groups is the ability to have like a list serve. So I send out an email to one address, it automatically gets sent to everybody else. The nice thing about that is I only have to update, uh, I as the owner, go in and update that, that list serve. Okay, we'll call it a list serve or email list or distribution list. But I'm going to go in, and as long as I keep that up to date, everyone else is going to be able to go in and receive email messages back and forth. The way this works, though, is we're using what's called Google Groups for Business. By default, with your personal Gmail account, you can use Google Groups, but you don't own that or manage that. So if you need to add a new, let's say that the person that created it leaves, there's no way for you to get in and say, I'm the new owner of that. You have to contact Google and I guarantee you're not the only person trying to get access to that, uh, to something. And you're going to have to go through all this authentication. Are you really you? Do you let it? You may never get ownership of that, that group. Where using Google Groups for Business, which is part of the nonprofit tools, you as, as, as an administrator, and by administrator, I mean for Google Workplace, the whole Google tools, you have a, a, a admin master or whatever, they can go in, turn this tool on. And at any point in time, if everyone was to leave, that person could go in and reassign new people in there. So I don't have to reset passwords or anything like that. Uh, I can do it there through my admin person, not through Google, um, Google itself. Here's the great thing about it. So we're on the board together. I send out an email. I'm gonna actually go here. This is the same window, it's just an open window. I send an email out to the board. Basically it comes to Google. Google gets this email and says, okay, who's, who are members of the board? Here's my five members. I will send the email out to those five people. And I'm gonna keep a copy of that message here. Someone replies back, the reply comes back to Google at board. Google says, okay, here's a reply. Who are the members of the board? I'm gonna send it out to them and I'm gonna keep a copy of that message. So you don't, as a secretary, even have to keep copies of all those emails. Google's doing that for you because it's all going through board at whatever your org is .com. So here we can see a conversation. Fred started off here. Barney had a reply. Trevor said something else. And then Fred said something there. 
All of that's captured here in Google Groups. You do not have to keep a local copy in your inbox as a secretary or as the president or anything else. That's already being captured. And the beauty of all that is it's searchable. So down the road, when someone goes, oh, you know what? We've talked about getting a bus. Who's that? I'm just going to type in the word bus. And it's going to go, hey, look, there's bus. I'll click on that. And there's the message. Now I've got the information on the bus and who, where the contact is. I can pull that from the previous conversations. So you don't have to clutter up your, your inbox. You can make use of that directly in here. And that's, uh, that's pretty much a great way of using these sites for individual, or sorry, for your board. You can use a, create a site for your public, uh, sorry, as your public facing website. So let's say mm -hmm. for example, um, maybe you're using Wix or WordPress to do your website. You can use Google Sites. You can set that up and then whoever's running your domain, you just say, you know what? I'm using Google Sites, point to that. You're not paying for Wix anymore. You get this uh, available and it's all part of Google for nonprofits. Trevor, there was one quick question in the in the chat just before we move on from that Google Meet. Sure. Uh, does a meeting inv inviting me to be a Google account to get into Google Meets? No, that's the whole, that's the best part of all of that. So, um, um, well, okay. We're, I will stop at three minutes too, but so meet.new, I'm gonna start a new Google Meet with my, my account here. And we'll see if it'll work. Hopefully hopefully the video conferencing tools won't, won't corrupt on me, but okay. So there's a, there's a meeting here. I'm gonna just copy this link here real quick. Ah, come on. Sorry, they move stuff around and I have to remember where everything is. There it is. So I'm just gonna copy this here. So I'm gonna open up what's called an uh, incognito window. So the, an incognito window means it's not logged into anything. It's like a brand new browser, not logged into Google, not logged in, into anything. And if you watch this, I'll go to gmail.com. If I was logged in, I would get a Gmail account, but it's asking me to log in. I'm not gonna take that link, add that in there. Oops. I have, to, I have a setting, so I have to go change my setting. So there's a setting in here, but no, you can basically join this. Uh, if you're invited, you can join this meeting. You do not have to have an account at all. So that's that's one of the nice things that I really like about Google Meets. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, we currently use Google Drive, create under board members, personal Gmail. Okay, well then, um, so can you transfer it? Yes. There, it's it's not a, a, an easy process, so it just depends on on how you're going to be doing at it. I, I can help you out. We need a little more uh, information on how to do that. Um, but yeah, it can be. I mean, I've done it for lots of places. It depends on whether you want to keep the historical data, uh, uh, like you know the list, the historical comments and stuff. If you don't care, you can just download it, upload it, and be done with it. And, and I've had areas do that. They just say, you know, I don't care about who made what comment. I just want this policy, yeah. whatever, just suck it down, upload it, we're done. And then you put that in Google Drive and then you can ask that president person, can you delete all those files? Because again, it's, 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 if they're shared, it, if it's a Gmail account, it's a personal account. It'll, it's owned by that one person. And, and I had a, a, a group that I talked with a few years ago and they said, yeah, the president quit. And he said, you know, I don't need these files. And he deleted all the files. They were all gone. So um, we, we managed to get them back, not a problem, but but that's the advantage of, of working with the, the drive. Mm -hmm. uh, think about us in the boat with the boards. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> okay, let me just, uh, last couple of slides here. Yeah, because I was gonna say, Trevor, I know we're coming up on the end here. I think that's the question that we haven't quite got to is how do we, how do we get there? How do they do right. this? Yeah. Okay. First thing you want to do is check if you're eligible. You, uh, as an, um, and so that's where you would go to Google for nonprofits. This is a link here and there's another link I'll show you later, but they'll tell you what the eligibility is. Typically it's uh, the way Google puts it is, are you doing good in the world? And are you uh, an actual registered nonprofit? You have to have an actual registered nonprofit certificate that you can forward with it. TechSoup works with Google. So TechSoup basically, instead of Google getting 10,000 requests for this, you know, make me a nonprofit, make me a non, TechSoup basically says, 
we will go and filter out all, uh, all the ones that don't apply. So you, the first thing to do is you register with TechSoup, you become a part of the nonprofit. So TechSoup looks is an organization that has all these different services and information for nonprofits. So you can learn a bunch of stuff from them, as well as access to Google, uh, as well as hardware discounts, Zoom discounts, whatever. But once you, re you register with TechSoup and then you say, I want to get Google for nonprofits, they'll go, okay, we will review your case. You've uploaded your certificate. Yes, we will we approve that you are in fact a nonprofit. And we give you this secret passcode. Then you would go, which is the validation. Then you would apply to Google and Google says, do you have a passcode? And you go, yes, I do, bang. And then Google will go in and do their magic and review it and then approve it. So the, the first two things that you really need, you need to have that copy of that certification. You need to have um, a really good mission statement. I always tell people, make sure it's a really well-written mission statement about how you're doing, doing good for the world and changing things. Cause that's the kind of stuff they look at. Not, I just wanna make better money. Um, so, and those two things and a domain. So www.trevorscommunityleague.com. That's really it. Sound, I mean, and when you get your domain, dub, 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 whatever, those guys will work with you to help you get set up with your, your Google workspace. There's a couple of different ways to do it. So here's links for more information on all of that right there. Once you get set up, Google has a bunch of great videos on how to take advantage of Workplace. So how to manage your volunteers using Google products. It goes through the step-by-step. Step. Here are the different tools you're gonna to use and how you use them. And then in the end, one of the last things I would suggest is must have spreadsheet skills. That's my list of videos that everything that you saw we did today, I've got them in like five and six minute segments. There's usually a spreadsheet attached that you can play with. I can't stress it enough. Everyone should learn how to use spreadsheets. And like I said, just because it helps full for manipulating data. I think that's it for questions. I'm just gonna look at all those things. Nope, no other questions. I think you got them all throughout, Trevor. That was fantastic. You covered so much content. I just wanna finish off. Um, so on June 28th, I am doing a hands-on uh, creation of a board of governors website. So assuming that you already have Google Workspace and you've got Google Groups for Business turned on, come on in, we'll go through and we'll build, build a site together. And that's on June 20th and you can register for the link here or else the original link. And that's one o'clock, touchdown. I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, any last minute, Trevor, do you have five minutes to stay oh, yeah. if there are a couple? Okay, residual yeah. questions. So um, again, don't worry, all that will be sent out in your follow-up and this is being recorded. So I know I'm going to go back over the video and, and pause a few times and, and take some more notes. Uh, okay, on the June 28th, yeah, Darlene, so yeah, there we go, on June 28th. Can you talk a little bit more to that, Trevor, what that exactly will entail, that session? Sure, do you, did you want to turn the recording off for this? Yes, or? I do. Yeah. Just give me one sec here.